Okay, so today we're going to be going over an 820-2936 that's not turning on. So somebody tried to replace their own keyboard and clean their motherboard, and it was working, just a few of the keys weren't working. And after replacing their own keyboard, now it is dead. So let's see what's going on here. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is plug in the charger with a fresh new DCN board to see what I get. And with a different known good DCN board, I get no light in the charger, no fan spin, and no anything. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up the uh, schematic and the board view for this model machine so that you can kind of get an idea of what it is that, uh, that I'm trying to do here and what it is that I'm looking at while I'm trying to diagnose the cause of the problem. So let's go over to the schematic over here and look at how this thing is supposed to work. That's not the schematic. That's the schematic. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go to page three of the schematic where they give you this whole little idea of how everything works. So over here, we have the AC adapter in. And that's going to go to this chip, which creates PPBus G3 hop. It's also going to go to this chip, which creates PP3V42, to this chip, which sends power to the SMC, uh, I mean, the reset signal to the SMC, which will tell the SMC to turn on. So let's get an idea of what it is I get at a few different points. So when I go to try and measure around this board, I'm going to put the voltage multimeter into voltage mode over here. And it's really, I finally got a cam camera angle that works for me, that is not, you know, interrupt uh, what I'm doing, but also allows you to see the multimeter, which is, which is nice here. Then what I'm going to do is I am, you know what, it would actually be better. You'd be able to see the meter better if I move this thing over a little and I move it to the side. So let's, might as well go ahead and do that now. Yeah, a little bit of a better view. All righty. So now I'm going to measure voltage on PP3V42. Now, to find PP3V42, what I would do on this board view software over here is I, let's just see if I can get it so you can view. There we go. So on the board view software, what I would do is I would type N for nets, which is going to show me every section on the board that a specific rail comes up or a signal, and then type PP3V42 underscore G3 hot. That is needed for the one wire circuit. If you don't understand why, please watch my one wire circuit videos. They're important if you are going to understand this one. I have many videos on the one wire circuit. They're usually about 10, 15 minutes. Just watch one of them. It will save you a lot of heartache and trouble. So I have 3.42 volts. Now the next power rail that I'm going to check, which comes in right after the charger over here, is going to be PPBus G3 hot. So let's check PPBus underscore G3 hot. Now I'm not going to expect to get anything there because I don't have a green light. I should have a green light. My, uh, you know, I have 3.42 volts, which is the rail that powers the one-wire circuit, but you know, I don't have a green light. So we're going to have to look into why it is that I don't have a green light. And of course, PPBus G3 hot is at 0.2 volts. So the way the one-wire circuit works is I need to have a power at a certain component. And I also need to have a signal at that component. So this here is adapter sense. This is where the charger is going to speak to the SMC on a data line. So the charger is going to come into this chip on external. Then it's going to speak to the SMC on the internal pin. Sys1 wire goes straight to the SMC. In order for this chip to receive the power that it needs at the VCC pin to turn on, it needs to have power delivered to it by U6901. And U6901 is going to take PP3V42 and pass it over here if SMC BC ACOK is present. So let's see if SMC BC ACOK is present. So I look for U6901, and U6901 is going to be right over here. Let's see, is this what I'm looking for? That is what I'm looking for, all right. So I am going to try it with the microscope now. I'm going to take a look at that area, see what it looks like, and give a little measurement. So let's get the board under the microscope over here so that you can see it. So this is U6901, and that area looks pretty nice, looks pretty fine, looks like nothing bad happened there except for my microscope trying to run away. So let's just tighten the microscope so it can't run away. So let's measure. So SMC BC ACOK is going to be present right over here, I believe. Let's see. So S yeah, right over here. So see, it says SMC BC ACOK over there. So let's check it out and let's see what I get on my multimeter when I measure that pin. So on that pin for SMC BC ACOK, I get 0, 0.000 volts. I am closed, so I'm not answering the phone right now. So we get zero volts there. 
So where does SMC, BC, ACOK come from? So let's see where SMC, BC, ACOK comes from. So SMC, BC, ACOK comes from the U7000 chip. So let's check out the U7000 chip. In other videos, I've said that this chip needs to receive 4 volts at charger ACN before SMC, BC, ACOK will occur. So this is where PPDC and G3Hot, which is the power from the adapter, comes in. The power from the adapter comes in through here and goes to this voltage divider. From this voltage divider, it's going to go to pin 3, uh, charger AC in over here. So let's see if I have voltage at pin 3 of U7000. And please stop opening this on the other monitor. All right, so U7000. Find this, and let's see. Where is R7010 and R7011? Right over here. So these two. So let's see if I have 4 volts over there. Let's also see what that area looks like on the microscope. So these little red points over here tell me a sad story for something that went on in this area. So you see that, and you see that. Well, let's, let's go, and go ahead and measure anyway. Let's also get this microscope to a more comfortable position. Okay. Yeah, swivel for me. Excellent. Good stuff. Okay, so... Focus. There we go. So let's measure. Interesting. Zero volts. Very interesting. So we have 16 volts at the top of the voltage divider, but at the other side of it I have zero. Hmm. Now here's where this gets tricky. The problem is that we could have a couple of, there's a couple of things that could be going on here. Let's just go over the couple of things that could be going on here. So, this chip, the U7000, could be pulling it to ground. This resistor, R7010, could be bad. R7011 could be open, meaning, no, I don't know I mean open. I mean, R7011 could be at zero ohms. R7010 could be at infinite ohms, or U7000 could be pulling that signal to ground. Now let's think a little bit about the basic electronics video series that I did where I said how resistors often fail. Resistors often fail to where they are working at infinite resistance. So we can throw out the idea of R7011 failing and becoming zero ohms pretty quickly. R7010 could very easily have opened and not be providing power. Or U7000 could be dead as a result of a shock to it and it could be shorting charger AC into ground. Let's take a look. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to measure R7010. And if R7010 manages to be around 30 kilo ohms, then I am going to jump to the assumption that U7000 is bad, just based on the knowledge that I have on how these resistors often die. Remember, capacitors often die where the capacitor itself has, uh, you know, it turns into a wire. They can very often short, but resistors themselves really don't often short. So what I see here is that I'm getting 26.22 kilo ohms, which is really close to the value on the schematic. So at this point, I'm going to make the assumption that my U7000 chip is probably bad, and my U7000 chip probably needs to be replaced. So this is where I'm going to turn on the rework station, and I'm going to get started with removing that chip and putting on another one. So first thing to do here is remove my U7000 chip, which is this one, so that I can put on a new one. Now I have the air filter on high and I have it located right next to where I'm working because I don't want to inhale any of this crap and I highly suggest that you do the same. Remember, it doesn't matter what other people tell you because nobody's going to care about your health the way you should care about your health. So if you're doing this stuff, use an air filter. Use a fume extractor. And if you can't, then at the very least, try not to inhale it. Do this and go every time you get stuck next to a bunch of nasty fumes. My Hacko FR801 has removed it with ease. Now we will prepare for placing a new chip. So I got my nice Hacko FM2032 here. I love this thing. 
Let's get rid of all the old junk and... Okay, too much solder on the center pad is my hallmark. I should have wicked that, but I didn't. Because it required changing irons, and I know I can get away without any of that. Okay, the chip has been removed. New chip is about to be applied. Way too much solder on the center pad is my hallmark. I really should stop that habit. Heat. Get you somewhere on the board. Here we go. Nice try. See how it's trying to spin? Trying to change orientations on me? Okay, and I push down really hard. The most important thing here when soldering the ISL 6259 chip. The most important thing is to make sure that you push down hard so that the chip itself actually gets soldered on the board. Because you may think it's soldered, but then when you look around at an angle, you'll realize that it's not soldered. That's what this really nice Hacko FM22 is good at, is going around and getting every single pin. So again, it may look like it's soldered from the top, but then you're going to look at it from the side and you'll realize that it's not actually soldered. It, you know, it's sitting on top of a mound, but one or two of those pads isn't properly soldered. So, the, you know, a really important thing when soldering these components is to have them flat on the board. And when you have a center pad, it's really easy for it to float on the solder on the center pad instead of, instead of actually uh, fall into place. So even after I know that I've pushed it flat on the board, I go around with this, and I want to feel every single pad. I want to feel every single pin. I want to feel each individual joint with my iron. And you can actually, and you'll feel it. You'll get used to this. I assure you, you will feel it. And you'll know when you soldered it on there properly. Soldering this chip in properly because of lack of knowledge or a shit station are very common causes of frustration and failure. So, what happened here is I plugged it in after replacing that, and as you can see, I have a green light, and my fan is spinning, which means that I solved my problem. So U7000 here was most likely pulling down my charger AC and signal because it was fucked, and it most likely got fucked by... Honestly, who the hell knows? I really have no idea what people do when they work on their own stuff, but it was fucked, and now it's not fucked, and now it works, and we have a happy 820-2936 ready to go back into a customer laptop. And that's that, and I hope you learned something. Oh, and the last thing I want to mention before I exit out of this video, because yeah, this is a common question. A lot of people ask me, you know, one of the things I want to learn from your tutoring class, one of the things I want to learn is how to measure each individual component. I want to know how to measure this, that, or the other. And the reality is you don't sit here measuring logic gates. You don't sit here measuring U7000s. What you do to fix these products is you just use your brain, you have regions, and you have theories, and you have ideas, and you, you try to turn those ideas into a working solution. So I know that sounds silly, but let's just look over here at this particular schematic. So... If I were to measure this resistor, right, let's say I'm measuring the resistors, the U7000 is shorted to ground, right? This is attached to ground on one end. So this resistor, R7011 over here, it's attached to ground on one end. So if I measure the resistance of R7011 with the fucked U7000, U7000 is fucked and shorted to ground, right? So that's over here, shorted to ground. This end over here is also shorted to ground. So when I measure that resistor, you think I'm going to get 9.31 kilo ohms? No. When I measure this resistor, I'm going to get 0 ohms because the U7000, which this resistor is attached to, is shorted to ground. Now, 
you may say, well, you could take the resistor off the board to measure it. That's the right thing to do. When I take a resistor off of a motherboard that has this many components that's this fucking small and I put it on the table, you know what's going to happen to that resistor? When I go to measure it, I'm going to go like this and I'm going to go, dink, it's, it, it's going to fly. It's going to go into the sixth dimension and I will never, ever see it again. So, you know, a lot of my, uh, my diagnostics is not measuring every single resistor, measuring every single capacitor. It's just having a little bit of an understanding of how the circuit works, getting an idea of what happened, how did this fail, why did it fail, what are some of the theories as to, you know, how it failed, how does what the board tells me line up with my theories as to why it failed. For example, having a little red probe points around the chip and then noticing that there are two things that could be shorted to ground, the chip or the resistor. And then just having an idea of how resistors work, res how resistors fail. Resistors usually fail open, where there's an open line and not where there's you know, uh, zero resistance. Just having all this stuff in the back of my head is what allowed me to fix this. It wasn't really measuring every single individual resistor or capacitor on the motherboard using the multimeter. So you can, you, just, to get, just to get it across, you don't fix motherboards by measuring every single component on them. You, it, you'll never get anywhere. You will lose your mind. You measure motherboards through having a bit of an understanding of how that board works, how that circuit works, asking yourself how, you know, what do you think the fault was, and then just, just figuring it out. No, I, I don't really know how to explain it much better than that.